Imagine this. You have managed to corner a vicious serial killer who has previously escaped from three maximum security prisons. By catching him, you either have the choice to turn them in and abide by the law, to let them go, or shoot them in the head with no witnesses or consequences for your action. What would, um, if you had this choice, what would you do? Um, let's actually have a show of hands. Um, who would let them go? Um, and who would shoot them? And who would turn them in? All right. Um, to shoot them would help the world because there's no more serial killer on the loose, um, nowhere else he can escape from, and it's a net positive for the world. But the objectively right thing, by the law, is to turn them in to the authorities and let them deal with your killer. Now, assume the serial killer is your significant other, your brother, your sister, or someone important to you. Now what do you do? And whose decision changed when it became someone that you knew? This is moral perspective. Truth is in the eye of the beholder, said Ruth Hubbard. This has never been so true. In this world, we have people fighting in the streets, um, burning down buildings, protesting and rioting, all because they believe that their perspective is the truth. We have people on the West Bank not fighting only a political but a religious war because they believe that they are fighting for the truth. But how do we, as humans, as societies, define what the truth is? Is it upheld by the laws that are voted on by the government? Or is the truth that we seek to find held deep within our morals and our values that we have accumulated from various experiences over the year? As human beings, we each have our own decision of what the truth is. Our personal truths, what we do and what we believe in life is based off of our morals. It's not that easy though. Morality is a spectrum, not a preset function like we have in our phones and our calculators. Our truths are based off the moral decision-making that we engage in throughout our everyday lives. These processes that influence our moral decision-making can vary based on perspective, scenario, or nuance. That's why some of your answers changed when it was someone you knew in the serial killer scenario. This moral perspective can influence a person or a whole group of people's outlook on the world and define their truth. There are four overarching moral perspectives that are seen in everyday life. The first of these four is called hedonism. Hedonism is a perspective that describes a person who wants to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. They are considered to be a type of egoist, as many decisions that they make are subjective, based on personal likes and dislikes. Gail Helgeson, one of my personal favorite short story authors, represents this perfectly in her story, Bluffing. One of the main characters, named Liam, withholds the truth about certain issues to his girlfriend in order to avoid conflict. Although these lies aren't objectively right, it helps them with their personal emotions and feelings, and it avoids conflict, it's morally correct, as it maximizes his pleasure and minimizes his pain. The second of these four is ethical egoism. Ethical egoism emphasizes the values needed for human survival of self, without the complications due to emotion. It holds people to do what is best for themselves without harming others and still being ethical about their decisions. All moral judgment from ethical egoists come off of their rational decision-making skills. They are also described as using common sense decision-making skills. Both hedonism and ethical egoism have the same objective, happiness. But hedonism has emotions calculated whereas ethical egoism does not. Let's go back to the lying scenario and bluffing. As third-party watchers, we can see this act of lying as immoral, but it may seem morally acceptable to the people involved in the, because the people involved have the context and nuance that third-party viewers do not. Liam and Gabriella's truth may not be the same as our truth. This shows how moral perspective influences a person's outlook on the world. Now, the next two overarching moral theories are a bit more abstract and not as commonly seen. First, we have idealism. Idealism is the practice of being entirely selfless. Idealists avoid violence at all costs and is based off of an individual's concern for other people. 
This sounds great, right? Well, part of the moral philosophy of being selfless is to not cause harm to others. What if an idealist is put into a situation where harming someone is the moral thing to do? Isn't there a sort, a sort of lack of depth associated with idealism? Anyways, on to the last one. To introduce this moral theory, I would like to talk about Philip Zimbardo's talk about the psychology of evil. In this TED talk, he speaks about the Stanford Prison Experiment, an experiment designed to test people's capacity to commit evil. There were two groups, the prisoners and the guards. The guards were told to do whatever they wanted aside from physical violence to the prisoners to see their reactions. Zimbardo speaks about how the power of the guards who were given influenced their ability to commit evil. This shows how positions of power can affect a person's moral perspective and even put themselves above the need to be moral. This manipulative moral perspective is called Machiavellianism. Machiavellians use people and manipulate them to reach their own personal goals, or in the case of societies with similar beliefs, will do anything to reach their societal goals. They believe that the ends justify the means. An example of this is in Hitler's Germany. Hitler manipulated and used the whole German population to help him achieve his personal goals, and he did everything, including genocide, to reach those goals. The Kohlberg Morality Scale judges a person's morals in three different stages. Pre-conventional morality, conventional morality, and post-conventional morality. Each of these three stages is divided up into two steps, as is shown in the diagram. Pre-conventional morality centers around punishment avoidance. This is seen a lot in children, and it is usually externally controlled. Parents, teachers, and other authority figures in the child's life tell them what is right and what is wrong, and they base the punishment off of it for doing, base it off the punishment for doing a bad action. Conventional morality is tied to societal and personal relationships. People at this level will still obey authority, but instead of obeying to avoid punishment, they believe they obey because they believe it is necessary to maintain order. Post-conventional morality is a lot more abstract. Most people over their lifetimes will reach step five and very few people reach step six. People who reach step five will acknowledge that although rules and laws are there for the greater good of society, they may not work for some individuals or some groups. Stage six deals with, many, with people who have their own set of moral guidelines, which may or may not align with the law. This person will be prepared to defend their viewpoint and opinions, even if it means dealing with societal punishments. A 2014 study conducted at the Decision Science Institute tested these four different overarching moral perspectives and their efficacy in moral decision-making based off of this Kohlberg morality scale. The test subject, who were tested beforehand for an aptitude of one of these four perspectives, were given a list of statements to rank from order from most important to least important in order to determine their stage on the Kohlberg morality scale. Here were the results. Machiavellians were found not only to exhibit but prioritize the lower levels of the morality scale, but were found to neglect the higher stages of post-conventional morality. This is slightly concerning, as the lower stages are more associated with avoiding punishment than doing what is right. Hedonists were proven to have a net positive influence on moral decision-making and acted on some of the principles of post-conventional morality. This result actually confused some of the scientists in charge of the study as one of the main principles of hedonism is the avoidance of punishment. This may have been due to the lack of real punishment during the study. Also, this study found that higher levels of education had a moderating effect on hedonists, allowing them to act with more ethical decision-making than their non-educated counterparts. Ethical egoists were found to not have a significant impact on ethical decision-making. It did have a positive influence in one scenario, which suggests that the utilization of ethical egoism is sensitive to the situation. As I said, ethical egoism is a common sense philosophy. So the only true way to determine the impact of ethical egoism is to put it under a situation where common sense cannot be used. Idealism had a negative impact on ethical decision-making. 
In the study, it is written that while an individual who is an idealist may care deeply for the people in the dilemma, they may also be prone to making decisions that overlook their decisions' effect on society as a whole. Being completely selfless in itself, although in moderation is a good thing, may also be a flaw if a person rejects their own sense of self. How does this relate to moral perspective and our personal truths? Each one of us fits under these categories to some extent. The way we look at the world, the way we look at other people is influenced by our decision-making skills. This defines our personal truth. This defines what is good and what is bad to us on a personal level. Gentlemen, your verdict. An article written by Mar Michael Bruth, Bruce gives readers a dilemma. There are 20 men stuck on a leaky submarine and there is only enough oxygen for five people. The article gives a short description for each of the men, including age, if they have a family, etc. The article tells readers to choose five men to save. How can a human make a decision like that? It's all in their perspective. Some may value family, whereas others may value education. There is no correct answer. This is the same with moral perspective. There is no right answer, no wrong answer, only opinions and perspectives. I would like to leave you with this painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. It shows in the middle, Earth, where we live. It just shows people living their lives. On the right panel, there's hell, and on the left panel, there's heaven. Historians have come to two possible conclusions about what the center panel represents. It is either seen as a moral warning or a picture of a lost paradise. In that time period, many people were extremely religious and the church had a lot of influence over the people. In my interpretation, this painting shows how what people may see as moral may not actually be and vice versa. We're all aiming for this objective heaven, but how do we reach it? The answer to that is in all of our hearts individually. Think about it. And until we have an answer to that, do what you feel is right in life, act on your truth, and hope for the best. Thank you.